move on it, as should every other parliament in Australia. Order. Senator Gallagher, questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, Senator Birmingham. My apologies. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Thanks, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time for the remainder of this week for personal reasons. In Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel and the Minister for Defence Industry. Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Home Affairs. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. The opposition expresses its best wishes to Senator Reynolds for a speedy recovery. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Minister for Defence claimed twice, for complete clarity, that she had met with the Australian Federal Police on two occasions, with the first meeting being on 1 April 2019 with Ms Higgins and her then Chief of Staff. The Minister was then forced to correct the record. This is the second time this week that the Minister for Defence has been forced to correct her statements during question time. Does the Prime Minister have full confidence in the Minister's account to the Parliament in relation to these matters? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, yes, the Prime Minister has full confidence in Senator Reynolds and in her uh, work in her portfolio and her handling uh, of these very sensitive matters, uh, including uh, her work to uh, ensure the Parliament is informed uh, in relation to these matters whilst being cognisant of the responsibilities, as Senator Reynolds has outlined, uh, to uh, treat carefully and with confidence information that was shared with her, uh, to respect Ms Brittany Higgins' right uh, to tell her story uh, and to be mindful of consequences for any potential police investigation. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to ensure Minister Reynolds' explanation of her conduct in response to allegations of rape in her office are accurate? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, uh, as, uh, as the opposition, the parliament uh, and more broadly is known, uh, there are a number of review processes underway uh, that, uh, that includes work in relation uh, to, um, to ascertaining um, the handling of events in relation to this matter. Um, However, it is also important that uh, that work is cognisant uh, of any potential implications in relation to police investigations too. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Oh, thank you, Mr President. The Prime Minister has publicly rebuked Minister Reynolds for failing to tell him of allegations of rape in her office two years ago. Minister Reynolds has said it is not her story to tell. Who is correct, Minister Reynolds or the Prime Minister? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, and I think Senator Reynolds has been clear in this place uh, that, uh, that in relation to the details of what, uh, what uh, Ms. Brittany Higgins shared with uh, Senator Reynolds and her uh, former chief of staff, that they should, that they should absolutely Order. make sure that, uh, uh, that um, Ms. Higgins's um, wishes and privacy are respected during that time. Uh, and that, uh, and that Ms. Reynolds, uh, Senator Reynolds has been careful in relation to the manner in which she has shared uh, that information. And the Prime Minister has indicated that in relation to matters of serious crimes, he would expect to be uh, informed, and, uh, and I think his statements stand in that regard. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is helping to chart our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Smith for his question. Indeed, Mr. President, uh, as uh, all Australians appreciate and people right around the world know, uh, in the last 12 months, the world faced the largest economic shock since the Great Depression. But pleasingly, Australia's recovery, Australia's economic recovery is working. We're seeing Australians getting back into jobs and seeing confidence building across the Australian economy. Just last week, we learned the unemployment rate had fallen yet again across Australia, from 6.6 per cent to 6.4 per cent in January. Indeed, more than 59,000 full-time jobs were created across the Australian economy in January. Around 93 per cent of those jobs lost at the height of the pandemic 
have come back. And that means hundreds of thousands of jobs have been created over the past few months, and pleasingly the majority of those jobs have seen Australian women re-entering the workforce. We have seen the underemployment rate hit its lowest level in years, Mr President. Not only are we seeing new jobs being created, but the economy is showing great resilience. Today, the wage price index increased by 0.6 per cent in the December quarter, beating market expectations. The outcome was driven by stronger growth in private sector wages, which increased by 0.7 per cent, the strongest quarterly outcome in private sector wages since 2014. We have seen business and consumer confidence get back to their pre-pandemic levels, resilience in the housing market and in motor vehicle sales. We have also seen resilience across the Australian economy in relation to government support programs, with more than two million people graduating off of JobKeeper in the December quarter and another half a million people graduating off of JobKeeper just last month. Fitch, the credit rating agency, has reaffirmed Australia's AAA credit rating, one of only nine countries in the world, Mr President, to have a AAA credit rating from the leading three credit ratings agencies. That's the testament to Australia's economic strength. There is a job to continue to do, but we are absolutely Order. seeing Senator significant Birmingham. progress. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the vaccine rollout will support confidence and help secure an Australian way out of the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. Uh, Fitch, in their uh, restatement of the credit rating, noted that the vaccine rollout should support domestic sentiment and said, and I quote, that our economy, Australia's economy, has weathered the pandemic well compared with peers and pointed out our successful virus containment and our effective fiscal and monetary response to the pandemic. The vaccine rollout commenced this week with the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine around the country. This is the significant step in our fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and the next stages of recovery. The vaccine rollout will help to reinforce confidence across our economy. We ask every Australian to get the vaccine, which is critical to protecting them from serious illness or potentially something even worse. People in priority groups who are most at risk and who need protection the most will and are receiving the vaccine first. Under our plan, some 240 aged care facilities across the country and 16 major public hospitals, 60,000 Australians living and working in aged care and disabilities care will Order. receive the vaccine Senator first, Birmingham. along Time with frontline workers. Has expired. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate further measures that will underpin our continued strong economic recovery post the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, as I said earlier, we have seen good news on the jobs front in January when we went through that last change in gear on JobKeeper and JobSeeker. We have always maintained that these were temporary measures designed to taper off as economic confidence recovered and momentum builds, and we are seeing that recovery underway. We recognise there are some challenges ahead, though. That is why we are making some of the permanent changes to our social security system, as announced yesterday. Uh, as at the 1st of April, 1.95 million Australians who are currently accessing working age payment will see a permanent $50 per fortnight increase in their rate of payment. It is, Mr President, the single biggest year-on-year -year increase to the rate of unemployment benefits since 1986, but comes at significant budgetary cost of around $9 billion. In addition, we are also permanently increasing the amount of money job seekers can earn before they lose a cent of payment to $150 per fortnight. This is a continuation of the carefully considered, balanced approach our government has taken through the pandemic Order, to supporting Senator Australians Birmingham. and the Australian economy. Before I come to you, Senator Keneally, could I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Thailand to Australia, Her Excellency Ms Buzadi Santipitaks. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Yeah. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. The Australian Federal Police National Guidelines on Sensitive Investigations, together with the AFP's guidelines for ministerial briefings, outline how the AFP must manage sensitive matters and keep the Minister for Home Affairs informed. The guideline requires that the AFP SES officers must brief the minister, and I quote, as soon as possible about matters where there is anticipated media attention or political implications. Did the AFP inform the Minister for Home Affairs about Ms Higgins' alleged rape in the Minister for Defence Office, as required by these guidelines? If so, when? And if not, why not? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Keneally for the question. Uh, Senator Keneally, I can advise as follows. I can advise the Senate that AFP Commissioner Kershaw first advised Minister Dutton of Ms Higgins' allegations on Thursday, the 11th of February, 2021. This was the first time the minister was advised of Ms Higgins' allegations. The minister received further verbal updates from Commissioner Kershaw during last week and this week. I am advised that the minister's office was not aware of Ms Higgins' allegations prior to the minister's briefing from Commissioner Kershaw on the 11th of February, 2021. As senators would know, Mr President, the handling of allegations and investigation of criminal conduct, including briefing to ministers, is a matter for the Australian Federal Police. Nevertheless, the minister has sought and received assurances from the Commissioner of the AFP that the investigation will leave no stone unturned. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The AFP de defines a sensitive investigation as likely to impact or be of significant interest to, quote, an elected member or associate or staff member of an elected member. Did the AFP declare the alleged rape of Ms Higgins in the Defence Minister's office as a sensitive matter consistent with the guidelines? And if not, why not? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and Senator Keneally. In relation to that question, I will need to take it on notice and revert back to you. Senator Keneally, a supplementary, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Higgins has said that Minister Cash's chief of staff told her, and I quote, "Don't worry, we will call Dutton." Did the Minister for Home Affairs or his staff discuss Ms. Higgins' case with any other minister or ministerial staff member, including Minister Reynolds? Senator Cash. Uh, again, Senator Keneally, uh, I re uh, refer to the answer I gave you in my first question in relation to any additional information on behalf of Minister Dutton. I will need to take that on notice and revert to you. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on the national COVID vaccine rollout? particularly to remote and Indigenous communities. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank you, Senator McMahon, for your question. This week is a historic week for all Australians. We are now into day three of the mass vaccine rollout across the country. We are prioritising the most vulnerable in our society to receive the vaccine first, Mr President. Aged care residents, uh, and border and quarantine frontline health workers are being offered the vaccine this week. Among the 240 facilities and 190 towns in regional and remote centres across the country to receive the vaccines this week, vaccinations are occurring in the Northern Territory, um, the territory you are so proud to represent, Senator McMahon. And I can indicate that uh, as of this morning, 249 residents of aged care facilities in the Northern Territory have received a vaccination. The Royal Darwin Hospital will also be working to vaccinate frontline health care workers, the most vulnerable are part of Phase 1A of the vaccine rollout. Phase 1B will include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, adults aged over 70, health, other health care workers, younger adults with an underlying health condition, including those with a disability, and high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire and emergency services and meat processing workers. Mr. President. Phase 2A includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 15 to 54 years, adults aged 50 to 69 years, and other critical high-risk workers. Mr. President. Phase 2B expands the remainder of the population over the age of 16. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that people on remote communities are extremely mobile, and on any day a large proportion of the population may be away. Can the minister detail how we are going to ensure that people receive their follow-up vaccination within the manufacturer's time frame? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator McMahon, for the supplementary question. The rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines into regional, and rural and remote communities is a vital part of the Australian government's vaccine strategy 
to protect our rural and remote communities and manage the fight against virus in the regions. Both the Pfizer, BioNTech and AstraZeneca vaccines are, require two separate doses for a person to be fully, fully immunised. Pfizer, BioNTech 21 days apart and AstraZeneca 12 weeks apart, Mr President. The rural health workforce has been integral to managing the challenge of the COVID pandemic over the year, and our rural health workforce is vital to the success, success of our vaccination rollout. And we will again be relying on them, uh, and we know we can rely on them, to follow up individuals and deliver for our remote communities. We commend the efforts of all the doctors, nurses, midwives, pharmacists and allied health workers Mr. President, in our rural and remote areas and thank them for their efforts. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the vaccination rollout complements the government's commitment to the health of Indigenous Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Improving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health remains a high priority for our government and a central component of the new national agreement on closing the gap, Mr. President. To drive progress towards our closing the gap Order. commitments, we are working in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health experts Order to refresh the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan. The Indigenous Health Australia's uh, health care pro program is investing approximately $4 million Mr. President, over four years to improve the health Order. and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The government recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians may be particularly vulnerable Mr. President, to the impacts and restrictions put in place as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we provided support to develop a culturally appropriate mental health and wellbeing resources to support First Australians Order. during the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. The Buy Now, Pay Later industry announced today a voluntary code of practice. The industry has claimed this will impose minimum standards across all providers, but the code still allows purchases up to $2,000 to be made without any checking at all if a user has any income or debts, and it means $10,000 of purchases, for example, could be made without the platform understanding if it is affordable for the borrower. If a provider violates the code, the only penalty is to be named by the Finance Industry Association. Does the government believe this is adequate? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President, and, uh, and I thank the Senator for his question. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission undertook a review into this sector and, uh, and determined that uh, a code should be voluntary. Uh, I am advised that, uh, that indeed an announcement of that was made by the sector today, uh, that, um, uh, that the sector has indicated um, it is uh, putting in place a code which I understand comes into effect from 5 October 2021, um, that, uh, that it's supported by regulatory powers that do enable ASIC to intervene uh, where it identifies significant consumer detriment and to ensure uh, that products are designed to suit target consumers. Uh, I understand uh, the code has attracted uh, support of more than 95 per cent uh, of the market um, in relation to uh, buy now, pay later uh, sector um, and has, uh, has crucial points um, that, uh, that any late fees must be capped, um, that it imposes uh, some compulsory membership obligations in the sector uh, that um, uh, that it must follow the design and distribution obligations from the ASIC review uh, and that uh, providers must monitor vulnerable uh, customers. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't, Senator, have details in relation to the precise thresholds that, uh, that you have uh, identified, but in terms of any further safeguards applicable under the code or other measures uh, for individuals uh, in relation to those lower threshold of, um, uh, of loans uh, or purchases, uh, I shall uh, bring any further information back to the chamber for you. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, buy now, pay later services do not require credit assessments, affordability checks, income verification or to comply with lending obligations. Now, in comparison, 
so-called payday lenders are regulated and must undertake comprehensive credit assessments and comply with responsible lending obligations. Why does the government regulate one type of short-term high-cost credit, but not the other? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, look, I, uh, I would uh, refer the senator to the findings of the ASIC review, uh, which, uh, which I think did look carefully at the differences in relation to uh, some of these sectors. Uh, there's obviously been uh, a rapid period uh, of growth uh, in relation to buy now, pay later arrangements with companies such as Afterpay uh, growing and creating a, a significant and popular arrangement uh, for consumers. Uh, the ASIC report highlighted that providers uh, are improving aspects of their business practices, uh, that, uh, that um, they're expecting membership of the Financial Complaints Authority as part of their operations, uh, that they're making information about their complaints and hardship processes more accessible to consumers, while others are now referring consumers to financial counselling services in the event consumers are facing financial difficulty. Uh, ASIC, I know, is continuing to collect data on this industry and monitor changes in it, uh, and will continue to do so in terms of the Order. consideration Senator of Birmingham. the different sectors. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Earlier this month, the UK government published a review of the buy now, pay later industry, and that review found the industry targets younger and less financially literate users, allowing them to access credit without checks and to hide debts from other lenders. Some users, of course, become trapped with unaffordable debts. That government chose to reclassify the services as credit providers and regulate them accordingly. When will this government do the same? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, I'm advised the UK government's uh, uh, review did acknowledge that buy now, pay later arrangements can also provide clear benefits to consumers um, uh, whilst they have sought to identify and address some of the regulatory issues uh, in the UK consumer credit uh, obligation. Um, what we see is that young people, uh, in particular, uh, are using less credit, uh, particularly fewer uh, reduced use of credit cards since the growth of buy now, pay later uh, services. And so there is some product substitution in relation to uh, financing options occurring in this regard. Uh, as I indicated before, ASIC will continue to review these, uh, these matters uh, and particularly the implementation of the industry code as announced today. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is leading generational change in our vocational education and training system to create a world class and uniquely Australian training system? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Brockman uh, for the question. And Senator Brockman, indeed, skills and training are at the centre of the Morrison government's Order. economic recovery plan for Australia as a Senator result Watt. of the COVID-19 pandemic. And indeed, as our Prime Minister has said himself, this will be a year of generational change in our skills and vocational education sector. And Mr President, as we emerge from COVID-19, the Morrison government will invest almost $7 billion—$7 $7 billion to keep apprentices and trainees on the job, but not only that, to actually create opportunities for 100,000 new apprentices and trainees to come on into the system and, of course, to help our fellow Australians who are in need of upskilling or reskilling so that they can move back into the labour market. Mr President, we are creating and transforming vocational education and training in Australia. And of course, critical to this is the work that we're doing through the National Cabinet for a new skills agreement, a new skills funding agreement to provide more transparency, but also to better link the funding that the Australian taxpayer ultimately provides to actual skills needs across Australia. And this new funding agreement will build on the work that we've already done as a government in relation to ensuring we have a strong skills system. And of course, the first thing we had to do, Mr. President, when we were elected to office, is clean up the mess created by those opposite in relation to Labor's vet fee help system. Now, colleagues, the problem with Labor is their policies linger. And I have to uh, just uh, inform the Senate that to date, in relation to Labor's disastrous vet fee help system, Mr. President, 
president. We have now spent, or the taxpayer has spent, over two billion dollars. Two billion dollars, colleagues, recrediting the victims of this disastrous policy. So the Morrison government cleaned up Labor's mess, and we are ensuring we're putting skills and training Order, at the forefront Senator Cash. of the economic Senator Brockman, recovery. Senator a supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I certainly do have a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate? on how the Job Trainer Fund is demonstrating the capability of the Commonwealth and the states to partner and provide world-class training opportunities to Australians. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as part of our record investment as a government, uh, the almost $7 billion that we are investing in skills and training across Australia, uh, this of course includes our $1 billion job trainer fund. And this is, as you know, in partnership with the states and territories uh, across Australia to provide free or low cost Australian uh, uh, low cost training uh, in areas and this was the key in areas of skills demand it's based on labor market modeling from the National Skills Commission and it's providing now job trainer over 300,000 training places as I said in areas of skills demand across the economy and uh, Senator Brockman indeed in our home state of Western Australia. Uh, we now have over 16,000 training places available. That's free or low cost training places available in areas of demand, and then includes courses like cybersecurity, horticulture, and disability support. Again, the $1 billion job, training, job trainer fund helping Australians upskill, reskill, uh, and Senator ensure that Cash. they're equipped Senator to get a job. Senator a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's use of employer incentives have kept apprentices and trainees on the job through the COVID-19 pandemic and how they will support a new generation of Australians to reskill and get high quality jobs? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, from the outset of COVID-19, the government understood that uh, one of our first economic priorities had to be to put in place the policy so that our employers could keep their apprentices and their trainees on the job where we needed them the most. And we've done that through our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. And that continues to run through until March this year. And in fact, Mr President, as at the 11th of February, the supporting apprentices measure has now assisted over 62,600 businesses, and I'm pleased to say, as the Minister for Small and Family Business, that that actually includes 98 per cent of that figure of small businesses, and it's helped them retain almost 120,000 apprentices and trainees. So that's 120,000 apprentices and trainees that have been kept on the job because of the economic response that the Morrison government put in place. And of course, we also have our $1.2 billion boosting apprenticeship commencements, which aims to create 100,000 new Time apprenticeships. The has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration and the Minister for Home Affairs. Minister, can you confirm that earlier this year there was a significant disturbance or riot at the Christmas Island Detention Centre that involved up to 200 canisters of tear gas being fired into the compound? What was the nature of the disturbance and were there any injuries? What steps were taken to ensure the safety of the family from Biloela, who are detained nearby? Were the family, in particular the young children, impacted in any way? including psychologically? What measures has the government taken since to assess the impact on the family, in particular the children, and to ensure their wellbeing? The Minister representing the Ministers for Immigration and Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. and I thank Senator McKim for the question. Uh, Senator McKim, I understand you are referring to uh, an incident that occurred in February of this year, February 2021, uh, whereby a male detainee was seen on the roof of our building at Villawood Detention Centre. I could, uh, in relation to then uh, what you are referring to, I will need to take that on notice uh, and get you um, some further advice on that. And it, in relation to the Billawheeler family itself, uh, that was part of the question. Uh, again, Senator McKim, and I know we've talked through this before, and I think it is one of those issues that we will need to agree to disagree on uh, in relation to that. But you'd be aware that the full court of the federal court, uh, their judgment was recently delivered. Uh, and certainly um, the full federal court, the department is now considering the implications of that decision, uh, as you know. Uh, but again, if I go back to the history 
uh, of the Biloela family. Just to remind the chamber that both adults arrived in Australia, Senator McKim, as you know, uh, as illegal maritime arrivals, uh, meaning that they paid a people smuggler and arrived in Australia illegally by boat. And after arriving in Australia illegally by boat, uh, they Order. met and they had two children. Uh, since 2012, and again, Senator McKim, I know you are aware of these facts, but just to ensure that we are, are placing them again on the record, the families claim to engage Australia's protection obligations have been compre comprehensively assessed, as you know, and the family has consistently been found uh, not to be owed protection. Uh, but again, Senator McKim, in relation to the issue that you raised at the beginning of your question, uh, to the extent that I can, I will seek further information for you uh, and ensure that you are provided with that information. Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. And just to assist uh, the minister, I believe it was about mid early to mid-January on Christmas Island. Minister, how much money has your government spent needlessly detaining the family from Biloela, and how much have you spent on legal costs against that family to date? How can you possibly justify that expenditure? Senator Cash. Well, again, Senator McKinn, we're going to have to dis uh, agree to disagree. Uh, you and I have done this dance before, and I don't propose to do the dance again. But I do need to remind the chamber that a fundamental difference between the Morrison government, those on the coalition side of politics, uh, and in particular <coughs> Senator McKinn, the Australian Greens and the Australian Labor Party, uh, is that we believe in sovereign borders. That is it. Full order. stop. Senator, and at Senator Cash, Senator McKim on a point of order. Um, order. Order on my left, Senator McKim on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. Point of order on um, relevance. I asked how much money the government has spent uh, detaining the family from Biloela and in legal costs against the family. And, and, I, I ask that you uh, remind the and minister. Senator McKim, that was the first part of the question. The second part was much more widely written. It was how can you possibly justify? Uh, uh, and, and, and I think, with respect, that the minister has a lot of discretion in answering such a wide question. Um, I, I regard that question as quite wide. The first part was quite specific, I grant you, but in this case I think the minister is being relevant to the second part of the question. Senator Cash. And that is exactly right. You, you did mention expense, Senator McKim. Uh, so I do need to remind you that uh, the border protection failures of those opposite, combined with the Australian Greens, cost Senator, the Australian Senator taxpayer. Cash. Senator Cash, Senator McKim on a point of order. Uh, yes, it's again on relevance, President, and in, in regards to your first ruling, that the second part of my question was how can you possibly justify this expenditure? That is the expenditure that I referred to in the first part of my supplementary question. So I, I would put to you respectfully that in fact it's quite a tightly worded question and the minister is not being relevant to it. Um, Senator McKim, the first part of your question I do regard as a, a, a factual question. The second part of the question asks the minister for an explanation, and, and your point of order goes to the content or the validity of that explanation. And I think that's a matter for debate after question time. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, Senator McKim, $17 billion. That is how I'm justifying it. $17 billion worth of taxpayers' money had to be outlaid to protect Australians from your border protection failures. 50,000 people arriving on 800 order. boats, 1,200 lives order. lost at sea. 8,000 children detained while Labor was in government, and in July 2013, let's just remind people, 10,201 people time for the in answer detention. Has expired. In Senator Cash, time for the answer has expired. There was too much noise approaching the end of that answer. Even I was having trouble hearing the minister. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you. As a final supplementary, could I ask the minister to clarify, was she, was she actually saying that she has spent $17 billion imprisoning and in legal action against the Biloela family? Could you first address that, please, Minister? Secondly, why are you ignoring the hundreds of thousands of Australians who have called for this innocent family's release? How much more money will you spend trying to deport them and lead needlessly detaining them? And why will you not do the right thing and return them to where they are loved and supported in Biloela? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President and Senator McKim. I'm just going to have to completely reject uh, the premise of your question. In answer to your question, let me just remind you, Senator McKim, that on this side of the chamber, the Morrison government side of the chamber, uh, we believe in sovereign borders. We will determine who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. Order. When you refer to 
the Biloela family, the I need to remind you that the principle is this. Both adults arrived in Order. Australia Senator as Keneally. illegal maritime arrivals, Senator meaning, Keneally, Senator McKim, Senator that they McKim. paid a people smuggler and they arrived in Australia illegally Senator by Keneally. boat. You may, Senator McKim, think that is OK. Sorry, Senator McKim, on a point of order. Uh, in fact, the entirety of that family did not Sorry, arrive McKim. Senator McKim, in what Australia. is your point of order? What is your point of order, Senator uh, McKim? The minister's misleading the Senate. Senator McKim, the content of answers is debated after question time. Can I ask senators for a little bit less disorder, please? Senator Cash. Well, well thank you, Mr President. And again, the fundamental difference, colleagues, is this. The Greens want to give the keys to our borders back to the people smugglers, and we say order. no. We say no. Order. We've taken Senator back Thorpe control of our point borders. Of order. I have Senator Thorpe on a point of order. Order. Senator Keneally. Senator Thorpe on a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and my point of order is uh, in relation to misleading the chamber on talking about sovereign borders. I'm afraid, Senator As Thorpe, a sovereign uh, Senator Thorpe, woman, please. Senator sovereignty Thorpe, Senator belongs Thorpe, to please us please and that family your seat. Is... Senator Thorpe, points of order must be about the standing orders. I'm not going to allow points of order to debate the content of answers, and I will take that very strictly. Senator Cash to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government, the coalition government, have taken back control of our borders from the people smugglers. Order, Senator Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. My, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Uh, it's a trifecta for Senator Cash. Um, Regional Express Airlines, which was the recipient of a multi million dollar support package from the Australian taxpayer throughout the COVID crisis, this week announced that it will axe five key routes across the country, including the Adelaide to Kangaroo Island route in my home state of South Australia. This comes a week before they launch their first Sydney to Melbourne flights. Has the federal government engaged Rex Airlines about these axed routes, including Adelaide to Kangaroo Island, and is the government considering extending its regional airlines assistance program which, the, which these routes are being subsidised with. The Minister representing the Minister of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator Patrick for the question. And, Senator Patrick, I can advise as follows. Uh, the government, uh, I can advise, is in daily discussions uh, with airlines to understand the needs of the sector and ensure our programs are supporting the communities that they fly to. Uh, you'd understand, though, that decisions on network configurations and scheduling are ultimately a commercial matter for the airlines themselves. Uh, and this includes, as you've uh, referred to in your question, Rex's decision to cease the Adelaide to Kangaroo Island route. Uh, the regional aviation network support does not compel airlines to fly two particular routes. However, we continue to monitor the future, uh, the need for future support, uh, whether it be through aviation measures or broader economic measures. Uh, you'd be aware that Rex is one of 15 operators receiving funding uh, to ensure critical aviation services, particularly in regional and remote Australia, uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on the aviation sector, uh, to ensure essential workers can travel domestically, support health transport services uh, and distribute critical goods and uh, equipment. The regional aviation network support, as you'd be aware, currently runs until March. Uh, and I am advised uh, that, we, obviously, as a government, we continue to monitor the situation and continue further support if necessary. Uh, Qantas themselves, uh, in a media release, has stated we will be reviewing our network and consider whether we can offer services on any of the routes that Rex is threatening to pull out of. And I, I think, you know, from the government's perspective, we've always been of the opinion that Australia's avia aviation industry. Uh, does have a bright future ahead, uh, and I am confident that we will rebuild throughout 2021 and beyond. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Has the government engaged South Australia's tourism minister, that's Premier Stephen Marshall, about the impact this axing will have on tourism in Kangaroo Island, uh, which is still recovering from the horrific bushfires last year? and a loss of tourism dollars from COVID-19 shutdowns and border restrictions? And if not, will they at some stage in the future? Senator Cash. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Patrick. Um, again, and I refer to uh, my answer to your first question. Uh, the government is in daily discussions with airlines uh, to understand the needs of the sector and ensure our programs are supporting the communities they fly to. Uh, the government also expects all state and territory governments to engage with airlines to ensure the required support for their local communities and regions are considered, particularly with inter- and intra-state routes. Uh, airlines, as you know, are receiving government assistance under different government programs uh, based on their specific circumstances. Uh, and as stated in my previous answer, order, decision Senator Patrick on a point of order. Just on relevance, uh, Mr. President, I, I was keenly interested in the engagement that might have taken place between the government and the South Australian Tourism Minister, Premier Marshall. You reminded the minister of the question. She has 18 seconds remaining to answer. I shall listen carefully, Senator Cash. Uh, and thank you. And in relation to those discussions, I will take that on notice. But the government, as I've said, is in daily discussions themselves uh, with the airlines. And our expectation, obviously, is that state and territory governments are also engaging with airlines uh, to ensure that the required support for their local communities uh, and regions is Order, considered. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, uh, what is the government's plan to ensure that the aviation sector remains safe? available and affordable to regional areas in Australia, and particularly uh, those reliant on tourism, such as Kangaroo Island. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Patrick, I can advise that in June 2020, the government directed the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, uh, to monitor the prices, costs and profits of Australia's domestic airline industry and provide quarterly reports to inform government policy. The ACCC continues to monitor airline activity and has published two quarterly reports on airline competition in Australia in September and December 2020. Uh, the programs that the government itself has put in place uh, have been targeted specific to the needs of Australian communities and developed, as you know, in close consultation uh, with the sector. The focus of the Australian government's efforts uh, has been to keep essential services running, and this has enabled funding to flow through to the aviation sector, ensuring that the maximum number of jobs can be supported. And, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time, but I could take you through uh, the five-year plan we have for aviation. Order. Senator that Cash. Wait for Senator day. Gallagher. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In an article entitled, entitled PM intervenes in submarine debacle. The Australian Financial Review has reported that, and I quote, two senior naval officers have been tasked by the Prime Minister Scott Morrison to examine options for Australia's submarine fleet amid ongoing tensions with the French over the $90 billion future submarines program. Can the Minister confirm that the Prime Minister is so concerned over the bungling of the future subs program by the Minister of Defence? that he was left with no choice but to intervene. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, no, I cannot confirm that, because I certainly do not accept some of the statements made in the Senator's question, Mr President. This government has taken strong action to ensure that our defence forces will have the capability they require for the future, in particular the naval capability they will require for the future. In seeking to deliver that naval capability, including future submarines, this government has also committed very significantly to ensure we build sovereign defence industry capability in this country as well. And the actions that we have taken stand in stark contrast, Mr. President, to the inaction of those asking the questions in this regard. Senator Keneally. As a government, Mr. President, we have taken serious action to make sure that we commission the building of new defence infrastructure, of new defence assets, of new naval assets in this country, including future frigates and including future submarines. And we have done so in contrast to those opposite who commissioned not one new Australian-built naval vessel. Our commitment is to make sure that these projects are delivered, Mr President, delivered according to the timelines that have been announced, delivered according to the commitments around Australian industry capability. And our focus will be on ensuring in that delivery that we secure the value for money. I, I, see, I hear Senator Wong say that you still haven't delivered on, like somehow they were going to be built yesterday. 
Well, they would have been built a lot sooner if those opposite had actually commissioned any Order. of them, if they'd actually made any types of decisions in that Order. regard. We have made the decisions to do them. We have Order. made the decisions to build these things, Senator Wong. Order. We have made the decisions that you failed to make. Order. We have made sure that we have made those decisions. We have signed those contracts. Order. There is indeed on the future frigates still being cut, Senator work Wong. happening work underway, and under your lot, you couldn't even make the decision to do it in the first place. We have the work commencing. Order, Senator, Se Order, Senator Wong. Senator Gallagher is on his feet. Senator Gallagher has the call. Order. Thanks, uh, Mr President. When did the Prime Minister make the decision to intervene and call in two senior Navy officers to examine the whole program? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the Prime Minister stays very close in terms of monitoring the progress on delivering against these critical national defence infrastructure capabilities. He works to make sure that order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Mr President, direct relevance. The Minister may have spent most of his first answer talking what happened almost a decade ago. This is a very, very specific question about when the Prime Minister made a decision to intervene. I'd ask you to draw this minister to the question. I've been listening to the minister for 11 seconds. I, I thought he was talking about the Prime Minister, so I'm going to actually... I, 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 Senator Wong, 11 seconds in, um, I haven't heard enough to determine that where he's going is not going to be directly relevant. I've allowed you to remind the, answer, to remind the minister of the question, and I shall listen to it. Senator Birmingham. Now, Mr President, as I was saying, the Prime Minister and Minister Reynolds and every member of the Cabinet are very focused on ensuring these projects are delivered to meet the naval requirements for the future. I don't, I don't accept all of the imputations in relation to Senator Gallagher's questions in the primary question or indeed uh, the fact that I'm going. There's a report in the Financial Review I hear from Senator Order. Keneally. Well, Senator of course, Keneally. of course, of course. We'll Senator just Keneally run off of media Wong. reports, shall we? No, order. what our government's focused on doing. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. When did the Prime Minister make the decision to intervene and call in the two, se two senior Navy officers to examine the whole program? That is the only question we have asked. I ask this minister to demonstrate some accountability to the parliament, some observation order, of the standing Senator orders, and be Wong, directly relevant. The minister was referring to the quotation in the substantive question that was related to this, I believe. Um, it, is, it is a very tight... But I cannot... I, 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 cannot, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question. At that point, he directly said he did not agree with some of the imputations that this question was drawn from, I believe, that were in the quotation in the, in the substantive question. So as long as, the Prime Min as long as the minister is narrowly construed to that, I can't instruct him on the content of the answer. I will take some advice after. I, I'm happy to take some advice, Senator Wong, after this. And if I am incorrect, I will happily report so to the chamber. Senator Birmingham. Now, Mr. President, I'm sorry to break it to Senator Wong, Senator Gallagher, or those opposite. But indeed, the Prime Minister and Minister Reynolds rely on a lot more than two senior defence officers in relation to the delivery of these critical pieces of defence infrastructure. So, Mr. President, we are working hand in glove with defence, yeah. with companies Order. to get Senator the assets Birmingham, our Navy the needs. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. When did the Minister for Defence first become aware that the Prime Minister was forced to intervene to fix this debacle? When? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, I completely reject that, that question and the underlying premise behind it, because Mr President, the Prime Minister and Minister Reynolds are consistently engaged and working together in relation to the delivery of these projects, along with the members of the National Security Committee of the Cabinet, along with the relevant Defence Department officials and agencies. That's what's happening, Mr President, is a government that works as a cabinet government, a prime minister and his ministers working together to make sure that we achieve the outcomes our government has set. And the outcomes our government has set to achieve is to deliver the naval infrastructure and capabilities Order. that we need for the future, to deliver the frigates, the submarines, the offshore patrol vessels, 
the investment indeed in other technology and capability that our Defence Department requires. $90 billion worth of commitments that we have made compared to the big fat zero that we inherited when we came to office. Order. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Said Seselja. Can the minister advise the Senate on the importance of gas in Australia's COVID recovery, especially in rural and regional Australia? The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, my friend and colleague, Senator Canavan, for the question. A gas-fired recovery is a key part of the government's JobMaker plan, and it is central to a strong Australia as we recover from the coronavirus pandemic. Now, Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy, and gas will be central to our ongoing economic recovery. We want to see Australian gas working for all Australians, especially uh, in our regions. And we're taking action to deliver more Australian gas to where it is needed at the right price. Now, this will be delivered through a comprehensive plan of 13 measures that will establish an open competitive hub model like the Henry Hub in the United States. Now, the three key action areas are unlocking supply, efficient transportation and empowering consumers. Now we're progressing a range of regulatory reforms and assessing what critical national gas infrastructure is needed to create a competitive gas market that will drive down prices. We're investing $220 million to support development in the Beedaloo Basin. Senator Watt, We've ensured our Senator major Keneally, gas exporters offer more order. gas on the domestic Sorry, Senator Seselja, please resume your seat. Se sorry, Senator Canavan, this is not helping. Senator Canavan, this isn't helping. We're wasting question time. Senator Keneally, you've been particularly voluble this question time. I'm going to ask you to restrain yourself for the last 10 minutes. Senator Keneally, Senator Seselja to continue. Uh, th thank you, thank Senator you, Stirl, Mr. President. Count to 10. We've ensured Silently. that major Senator Stirl. We've ensured that major gas exporters offer more gas on the domestic market more often and on more competitive terms, meaning lower prices. We're developing an industry code of conduct to address pricing principles, and all of our collective efforts are delivering results. Even before COVID-19, we saw reductions in the domestic spot price across eastern Australia, and these prices have continued to fall. Wholesale gas prices on the east coast during 2020 were around 40 per cent lower than prices in 2019 and these prices remain low. Lower gas prices are also driving down wholesale electricity prices. Those opposite can't even work out if they support gas, but thankfully for Australian households and businesses, Order. we Senator, are confused Senator, on the Senator issue. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. On my left, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how Australia's manufacturing sector will benefit from a gas-fired recovery? Senator Seselja. Thank you very much. And I thank the Senator. The gas is a critical enabler of Australia's economy. It supports our manufacturing sector that employs over 850,000 Australians and is an essential input in the production of a range of items, uh, such as plastic for PPE and fertiliser for food production. Ensuring a reliable, stable and affordable supply of gas to power Australian jobs and industries is one of the highest priorities of this Liberal and National Government. Those opposite don't have a plan to secure dispatchable capacity that the manufacturing industry will rely on into the future. And we know, well, we know, Senator McAllister, we know what your plans are. That's because their real plan is always higher taxes, more and higher taxes. We saw it at the last election with their $387 billion plan for more taxes. They've only got one plan. The Liberals and Nationals can deliver the secure, reliable and affordable energy that will underpin our economic recovery, create new jobs and Order, grow Senator our Mr. manufacturing Senator sector. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Um, can the minister also Order. outline to the Senate how gas can help bring down energy prices for everyday Australians and any risks to delivering increased gas supply Senator, and Senator lower Watt. energy prices. Order, Senator Canavan. Senator Watt, we cannot slip to the point where I can't hear the question. What, rem, remember my rule, Senator Watt. Count to ten after your name is called silently, at least. Um, Senator Seselja. 
Uh, well, thank you very much. I thank Senator Cameron for the question. I thank Senator Watt for the interjection as well, because because he's talking about you know he's forgotten what he stands for. And I'm asked whether there are risks. Well, there are a number of risks. Uh, the leader of the opposition, the shadow minister for energy, and of course the shadow minister for Queensland resources. He is a risk. And you, know, you talk about forgetting what you stand for. You can imagine. You can imagine going back to activist Murray Watt how he would be shaking his head now. He would, when it went back when he was handing out free joints at university, he would be shaking his head. Uh, he would be shaking his head that he now has to pretend to support the Queensland resources industry. I mean, does he actually support it or does he just have to pretend? I mean, it reminds me of George Costanza having to pretend to be an architect. At least his heart was in it, Murray. At least his heart was in it. We support the gas Order. industry, whether the Order. Labor Party does or not. On my right, we're not going to get into desk banging. Senator Chisholm. A very lame act to follow. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister Order. representing the Minister Sorry, for Health. I'll, I'll allow Senator Chisholm to start again because I can't hear it. On my right, Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. I refer to disturbing reports today that two elderly Queensland aged care residents, aged 94 and 88, have been given four times the recommended dose of the COVID-19 vaccine by a doctor contracted through the federal government. Which one of those residents, with one of those residents being hospitalised as a result? How has this mistake been allowed to occur? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and uh, thanks, Senator, Senator, for the question. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very important question, Mr President. And just can I say at the outset, I think I might have said uh, an incorrect number in my previous answer. It's, I said four Order. million instead of four billion, Order. so I would like to correct the record on that to start with. Mr President, the, the, circumstance that occurred in, the circumstance that occurred in Queensland yesterday, Mr President, should not have happened. It should not have happened. Uh, the government is just as concerned as anybody else in this chamber with respect to the circumstance that occurred in uh, Queensland yesterday. What, did, what occurred is, uh, on my advice, Mr. President, there was a clinical incident that we're at a uh, scheduled vaccination clinic at the Holy Spirit Home in Castledean, in Queensland, where the vaccination provider, where the vaccination provider dispensed more than the prescribed dose of the Pfizer vaccine to two residents, Mr. President. Uh, my understanding is that they are both currently in hospital. Um, but fortunately, Mr. President, uh, they are both uh, well at this stage. They're both okay, which is quite important uh, for us to all understand, Mr. President. Both, both families, and both, Order. both families have been advised of the incident, uh, and the uh, chief deputy chief medical officer, Professor Michael Kidd, has been commissioned to co conduct a thorough investigation of the circumstances of this event, Mr. President. Uh, once the circumstances are understood, the VOC will work with the provider to implement the appropriate safeguards to prevent these events occurring again. Mr. President, uh, the, the doses were both administered by a GP working on behalf of Healthcare Australia, who obviously are the contracted uh, contractor for Order, providing Senator the service Colbeck. in Queensland. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. On 16 February 2021, in a joint re press release with the Minister for Health, Minister Colbeck said that, and I quote, the Australian government would be responsible for leading the implementation of the COVID-19 vaccination program in the aged care sector. Does this minister accept responsibility on behalf of the Morrison government for this mistake? Of course not. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, the Senator is correct in the fact that we have contracted, as a federal government, two companies to undertake the vaccination rollout in aged care facilities across the country, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and this is a very important rollout process, as I have indicated on a number of occasions over the last two weeks. Uh, the fact that we have now commenced 
uh, the vaccination rollout in aged care facilities to protect senior Australians is one of the most important things that we will do as a part of order. the COVID-19 recovery Senator process. Wong on a, Senator Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance. The minister has been asked whether or not he accepts responsibility on behalf of the government for this mistake. I'd ask you to remind him of the question. Senator Wong, again, my view, and I will take advice from the clerk on this, is if the minister is, re re is keeping his comments to a narrow construction of the question, and the question referred to the Commonwealth responsibility or the Australian responsibility for rollout in the aged care program, I can't go to content of his answer. He's not free to talk about anything else, but I think that is directly relevant. And I, as I said earlier, I'll take some advice from the clerk about this. Um, but I believe, I, I believe I'm being asked to direct him on content. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And the government is being quite open and upfront about this whole process. In fact, the health minister came out this morning and conducted a press conference with the chief medical officer to inform people of the circumstance. We have been working with the Queensland chief health officer in relation to it, and we're doing everything we possibly can to ensure the integrity of the rollout program because we do take responsibility for it across the nation to ensure senior Australians Order, are protected Senator from COVID-19. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Lincoln Hopper, CEO of St Vincent's Care Services, has said that the mistake has, and I quote, caused us to question whether some of the clinicians given the job of administering the vaccine have received the appropriate training. Why has the government neglected to ensure proper training in the rollout of the vaccine? Order. Senator. Order. Senator. Order. We'll get to this last answer when there's some modicum of order across the chamber. Senator Ayres, Senator, Senator Canavan, Senator Ayres, Senator, Senator McKenzie, Senator Rennick, Senator Colbeck to answer the question. Thank you, Mr. President. And this is, this is an important question. I acknowledge that this is a very important question. Mr. President, the vaccines were administered by a trained general practitioner, a doctor. Mr. President, the doctor has been stood down pending an investigation by the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, as I've indicated before, uh, and a full investigation is being undertaken by the Deputy, Deputy Chief Medical Officer in conjunction with the Queensland uh, Chief Health Officer, the local PHN, uh, and we appreciate the cooperation of the Queensland show, Dr Jeanette Young, as a part of this process. Our determination, Mr President, is to ensure that this rollout occurs effectively, appropriately and safely for all Australians, uh, particularly those in aged care. Uh, there is a training program that was in Order, place Senator for Colbeck. those who time, are rolling out this program. Time for the answer has expired. The, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, I further a table for the Senate in further information in relation to Senate order for production of documents number 786, uh, outlining the information provided to the, C the Senate Economic References Committee on 7 and 8 December 2020. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Um, Mr President, um, pursuant to Standing Order 745, I ask the Minister representing the Treasurer for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to question on notice number 2391. The question relates to 12 recommendations made in the Callaghan report into petroleum rent resource rent tax and implementation details. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. I thank Senator uh, Hanson. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not aware that I had prior advice. I apologise if my office did, uh, but I've not had uh, an opportunity, certainly, to uh, ascertain the status of that answer. Uh, I shall check that with the Treasurer's office and, uh, and revert it to the earliest opportunity. Senator Hanson. I move that there be laid on the table by no later than 4 p.m. the 15th of March 2021. The answer to the question on notice, number 2391. On the 13th of April 2017, Michael Callaghan handed the final report of the Petroleum Resource Rent Tax PRRT, review to the government. Like many others, I want to know how many of the recommendations have been implemented. 
Consequently, on 7 December 2020, I asked the Treasurer to provide details of the legislative implementation of the 12 recommendations made by Callaghan nearly four years ago. I have had no reply to my written question on Notice 2391. The government can be likened to a meandering river which seeks the easiest path as it makes its way to the sea. We see that in the management of Australia's offshore oil and gas resources. The vast reserves in, um, of oil and gas under the seabed off the coast of Western Australia has been sold too cheaply to foreign-owned oil and gas companies, and now the Investor State Dispute Settlement or ISDS provisions in free trade agreements make it costly to write policy which is against the interest of Australians. The government is willing to protect the financial interests of private media companies in respect of foreign-owned goods like Google and Facebook, but introducing a media code, but the government will not stand up for Australians so we get a fair payment for our oil and gas from Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, Conoco, Philips, Y. In 2019-20, these foreign-owned oil and gas multinationals controlled most of the offshore oil and gas leases. They exported $48 billion of liquefied natural gas to Japan, China, South Korea and other Asian countries. As owners of the gas, we received a payment of about $200 million in 2019-20, or one twenty-fifth of 1 per cent of the $48 billion in sales. The other 99.996 per cent of the $48 billion went to the companies to cover costs and generate profits. None of that 99.996 per cent was paid as income tax because these transnational companies have $350 billion of tax credits. Let me repeat that. $350 billion of tax credits, courtesy of the PWRT law introduced by Labor, Labor in 1987. One twenty-fifth of one per cent in every dollar of gas export sales represents the lowest gas payment in the world to owners. Why doesn't the government want to get a better deal for Australia? Australia is the only large producer of gas in the world where the domestic price is higher than the, um, where the export price of gas is higher than the domestic price. This is the finding of the ACCC. So what is the government doing? It is encouraging expensive to extract onshore gas as if it is an alternative to cheap to extract offshore gas and oil. How can we have globally competitive electricity and manufacturing in Australia when our competitors have cheaper gas than we do? The government's gas-led strategy is a fiction until the government reforms the gas laws. The government has had years to put Australia in a competitive position but has so far refused to do so. The next election is the government's to lose. But that will not stop me advocating for the best interests of Australians everywhere. The best interests of Australia are served by the government acting too. Introducing a domestic gas reserve policy in Australia with its offshore, in its offshore water um, to 15 per cent of all gas um, that comes into Australia. Changing the PWRT law so we get fair payment for our oil and gas. Removing multinational oil and gas companies from the company tax system and putting them in a transaction-based tax system. And investing in regassing terminals in the eastern states to bring offshore cheap gas from the west or build a gas pipeline from west to east. One Nation is the party of energy security in this country. I've raised this many times on the floor of this parliament about the gas that we are losing to overseas. And the government is, has been, not only this government, the previous government as well as Labor, have only spoken about um, sovereignty and worried about sovereignty. As I pointed out as well, you have leases of the uh, west coast of Australia. They are actually 30 years. There is nothing that I've taken to the government that will use it or lose it, which they have never done. So they let them, these multinationals, sit on these leases, do nothing about it. They don't have to work it, and they are waiting till they use up all the supplies around the world. And we're the silly buggers here, letting them have their leases until they run out of their gas in other parts of the world. Then they will come and tap into ours, and we do not get it. 
Western Australia is the only one. If it comes into the state, then they will actually get 15 per cent of that domestic gas supply. But the companies now are building large pipelines of over 900 kilometres to put that pipeline that comes into the Northern Territory so they don't have to give 15 per cent domestic gas supply to Australia. And yet we are charging Australians more for the gas in this country than what they are um, being uh, charged to export it out of here. And if you think that $48 million, if you think that receiving $200 million in tax is good enough on a $48 billion gas export in this country, well, you shouldn't be in government, you shouldn't be working for the people of this nation because you've done rotten deals over the years and you've sold out the Australian people. And if you look at what Norway has done, they've made a lot of money out of their resources and the people in that country are quite rich. So we're living on the bones of our backside here because the governments are giving away our gas to other countries to take it and use it. And that's why we've lost industries and manufacturing in this country, because the whole fact is the cost of energy, and you're quite prepared to actually make it uh, uh, a cost and you sustain these with renewable energies, but you don't look after Australians to use our own gas at a cheap price so we can actually drive industry and manufacturing. And that's why a lot of them close up. We're losing jobs in Australia because you allow the cheap imports to come into Australia, destroys our industries and manufacturing, so, and they can't afford the cost of running their businesses and they can't afford the cost of energy. So until you get your act together and rein this in, and through $350 billion in tax credits, $350 billion, that's why Chevron said we'll never pay tax in this country until you look at it on a turnover basis. And when your former resources um, minister, Canavan, when I spoke to him about it, he allowed a platform to go into the into the uh, off Western Australia and all they did was have to hook it to the, to the, to the bottom and that's it. Take whatever you want. It. There's no, there's no um, accountability whatsoever, and um, I am just absolutely disgusted with this government. So I'd like to have this report. I want to know what's happened with those 12 recommendations that is uh, from four years ago from the Callaghan report, and the people of Australia have a right to know. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Could you just clarify for the Senate, please, the date that you are requiring the OPD? 4 p.m. Um, the 15th of March. Thank you, Senator Thank Hanson. You. Senator Patrick. Yes, I rise to take uh, note of the answer as well. Uh, this is becoming a regular feature of, uh, of this part of the order of the day. Uh, and the problem uh, we're encountering is that uh, the government uh, is allergic to scrutiny. The government is not answering questions on time. The government is not returning OPDs in the fashion in which it should. And this is, uh, this is quite important. I said in my first speech that I thought that the Senate does the job of legislating pretty well. It, uh, uh, bills are brought into the chamber, uh, we, uh, into the Senate. We uh, deal with them through the committee stages. We uh, come in to the chamber at uh, uh, second reading and make our explanations as to what we think about the legislation. We then uh, debate them at committees. Uh, and you know, we often amend legislation. We often make it better. Sometimes we even reject it. We saw this week the government, uh, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, Senator Stirl, refer something off to committee halfway, uh, halfway through the committee stage because the Senate got to a point in its deliberations where there was the need to perhaps to, to examine the legislation further. We do that very, very well. What we don't do well in my view, is the scrutiny role, which is the much more in, important role and, of course, for which these questions on, on notice and these OPDs um, are necessary. I uh, read again the, the words quoted in Odgers of uh, US President Woodrow Wilson describing the informing role of the Com Congress, stating, it is the proper duty of a representative, representative body to look diligently into every affair of government and to talk much about what it sees. It is meant to be the eyes and the voice and to embody the wisdom and will of its constituents. Unless Congress have and use every means of acquainting itself with the acts and the disposition of the administration, administrative agents of the government, the country must be helpless to learn 
how it is being served. And of course, John Stuart Mills also um, uh, has contributed to this area, uh, and it's been quoted in the, in the High Court case of Egan and Willis, summarised uh, our task as follows, to watch and control the government to throw light on the publicity of its acts. Applied to the Senate, these principles make it clear our role is not just to review and pass legislation. Indeed, as President Wilson said, the informing function of Congress should be preferred even to its legislative fun function. That's particularly important in this place. In the House of Representatives, in the other place, uh, the government has a majority, so the scrutiny function of the House is such that uh, uh, it's, 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 it's um, impotent because of the numbers. I've actually had members from the other place say to me, why isn't it that the House can do OPDs? And the answer to that uh, question is, well, of course it can. It enjoys the same powers as the Senate by way of section 49 of our constitution, going back through um, uh, the uh, history of, uh, of the House of Commons. Ernst, um, Ernst and May uh, uh, is the, uh, equivalent, the House of Commons equivalent of Odgers, Erskine May. And, uh, uh, it's a great read, and, and senators should have a read of some of the things that happened there in order to get scrutiny in order to get scrutiny happening. Um, one of the things that uh, I said in my opening speech, and I'll, I'll read from it again, questions on notice tabled in this chamber are not, often not returned within the 30 days required by the standing orders. The same is true for estimates questions, where answers to questions are often returned to committees at the 11th hour. It's dis disrespectful of the Senate and of the citizens from, uh, to whom uh, the questions are asked for, and it shouldn't be permitted. I also said of orders for production. All too often, orders for, for production of documents have been met with contempt. An order for production is made. The government gets, advances an argument for public interest immunity, however tenuous that argument might be. Invariably, the Senate does not accept the public interest immunity claim, and the government insists on its re uh, refusal to provide the document. And then the Senate does nothing except weaken itself. So Senator Hanson has, has risen and, um, and rightfully asserted her right as a senator to seek an explanation as to why uh, the government is ignoring the scrutiny requests of the Senate. It's extremely important, extremely important that there is respect from the executive in relation to the Senate and in relation particularly to the Senate's oversight role. Again, this stems from section 49 of the Constitution. We saw yesterday uh, in, in, in a debate relating to a, another OPD that had not been returned that uh, the government was relying on conf confidentiality in a contract, as though, as though someone in the Department of Defence can, take a con can make a contract and sign it and say it's confidential, and that somehow overrides the laws of this country. And of course, that is a nonsense. It can't. I know yesterday when, um, when, um, uh, when Senator Birmingham st stood and made explanation or part explanation in relation to uh, documents that haven't been provided to the Economics Committee, and I do acknowledge further information has been tabled today, and I thank the minister for that. Um, that uh, the documents were too commercially sensitive for the Economics Committee. What a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. I've seen some of these documents, and uh, again, the committee is not, no, is not asking for these documents to be made public, but they are not in any way sensitive. In fact, their markings are such they don't seek to protect themselves anything other than saying commercial and confidence. The, the uh, commercial and trade secrets of a, uh, uh, of a defence company are very similar often, uh, uh, often to other jurisdictions in that they can cause commercial harm. Yet the, uh, the minister makes a claim that somehow these commercial documents are so sensitive 
that the, uh, that the chamber can't see him. And Senator Gallagher um, uh, uh, rose uh, and talked about his experience on the Public Works Committee, where they look at this sort of stuff all of the time. So, to the government, you have to get your act together. You have to start answering questions on time. Information has temporal value. Getting an answer a year late or getting a response to an OPD uh, a year late, or in fact, as we know, responses to, uh, to uh, Senate reports. I know the, the president makes a report every so often about how many responses to committee reports that are overdue. Maybe I'll have to start looking through the standing orders to look at what can be done in relation to that. The Senate goes off and does a whole lot of work in relation to committees. They consume uh, the time of senators. They consume the time of all of those uh, people who make an effort to contribute to those committees. They often travel long distances. Uh, we have the secretariat working really hard behind the scenes to make, uh, uh, to make a good report that goes to government, and then the government ignores it. So, you know, Senator Hanson standing, rising to her feet, seeking an explanation, quite valid. And the government really does have to pick up its act in this regard. I said yesterday, and I'll say it again today, it appears that uh, scrutiny to the Prime Minister is as kryptonite is to Superman. It makes him go weak at the knees. We can see that in, uh, in respect of uh, uh, the Auditor-General. The Auditor-General having his having his uh, audits cut from, uh, uh, from uh, 48 audits down to 36. Not acceptable. Does not the government understand the bang for buck you get by having a, uh, an empowered auditor uh, watching over uh, departments of government, making sure that everyone in government thinks, you know what, there's a chance we might get audited. And therefore, we will make sure we absolutely do the right thing. And yet, there's arguments going on about whether it should be 36 or whether it should be 48 audits. But when the reality is, it should be 75 to 80 audits. It should be expanded. We should have a, um, a much bigger remit for the for the Auditor General in terms of oversight, because you know one of the things we're running into regularly is the, a, a, a non-response a non-response to questions, a non-response to OPDs, non-response to, to committee reports. It is not good enough. And uh, um, to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, if I have to stand up every day and point out the fact that you are not permitting uh, the, the, um, or, or that you are not taking uh, the Senate uh, seriously in respect of its scrutiny role, then I will. And uh, you know, if you want to use up all your legislation time uh, having us debate things like this, then so be it. You just you need to understand the importance of it. Get your staff to start looking around as to what has not been responded to and what has. And stop advancing public interest immunities on OPDs when they should never have been advanced. And I, I say that with authority, having had a number of OPDs that have been requested and not responded to by government or responded to with a PII, for which I've then gone off and got under FOI time and time again. Time and time again this, is ha this has occurred, whether it be a future frigate tender, which was uh, the subject of an OPD and not returned on the basis of confidentiality or national security. Under FOI, I got the lot of it. Whether it's uh, a macroeconomic report into future submarines, which was claimed to be cabinet in confidence, which I now have, and I now have it because I got it under FOI. The government has to start taking seriously the role of the Senate in terms of scrutiny. It's no longer going to be the case that, uh, that we just let things slip by. I'll be going back to my office. I'll be looking for every question that's late, and uh, tomorrow I'll be seeking explanations. So you are, you are warned. 
I've done my, uh, my, my duty as, uh, as is uh, uh, recommended by the clerk in respect of making sure that we behave in a re responsible manner. I'm giving you the warning. I will look to the list of questions on notice and we will, uh, I will see which ones have not been answered. And I'll be here seeking explanations on all of them. And if it takes me uh, the rest of tomorrow, then so be it. And I'll have a look to some of the OPDs. And I'll certainly have a look and I'll be seeking advice uh, from the clerk in relation to all of those Senate committee reports that simply have not been responded to. That annoying, pesky Senate, keeping the, uh, you know, keeping the, the, uh, the executive occupied because of its scrutiny role. That's kind of how uh, the feeling is. Well, it's got to change. It's got to change, uh, Minister, otherwise we're going to have interruptions like this all of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister? Thanks, um, thanks Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President, uh, as I indicated uh, when Senator Hanson posed her question, I had not had uh, forewarning in relation to the particular question uh, and so did not have information to hand at the time. Uh, in that relation, uh, could I invite Deputy President at least um, uh, consideration of, uh, of any past rulings in relation to um, the convention of, uh, of notification, its intersection with uh, then uh, within Standing Order 74.5 um, the definition of, uh, of what is an appropriate explanation uh, that triggers um, opportunities under 745C uh, versus 745B, um, uh, where, uh, where if no explanation is provided, a motion such as that moved by Senator Hanson uh, can, be, uh, can be undertaken. I believe that I did provide uh, an explanation. Um, albeit that, uh, due to the absence of uh, uh, forewarning, I was unable to give detail to that explanation um, at the time. Uh, uh, and um, it may be useful in future to have clarity in relation to that and whether there have been any previous rulings on those matters. Uh, nonetheless, um, I can table for the Senate um, answer to uh, Senate question uh, from the Treasurer, uh, PQ 20 000128. Uh, in relation to uh, the 12 recommendations made in the Callaghan report into the petroleum resource rent tax. Um, uh, in tabling that, it would render uh, the motion uh, moved by Senator Hanson um, unnecessary. However, the government won't oppose it if it's simpler for the Senate to still proceed with the motion. Uh, thank you, Minister. I understand that um, the motion is moved by Senator Hanson is consistent with previous practice, although I note your comments about not being given um, notice of the impending uh, notice, which is a customary thing that we do. So that's on the hand side. Uh, if no one else is seeking... Oh, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Deputy President. As Minister Hunt has just advised the other place, we have some further advice. Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Colbert. I just need to deal with this matter and then I'm, I'm happy to come to you. So the question is that uh, the motion as moved by Senator Hanson for the production of the OPD uh, by March 15, 4 p.m. be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Colbert. Thank you, Deputy President. As I was say, saying, uh, on, uh, as the Minister for Health and Aged Care has just advised the other place, we have some further advice from the DCMO, uh, which uh, relates to my answer to the last question in question time regarding the status of the training of the doctor involved. Um, Mr. Pre um, Deputy President, we had a statement from the VAC, the Vaccine Operations Centre, that Healthcare Australia had confirmed the training the doctor had undertaken the training, uh, and we had some other advice from the DCMO. HCA has advised that the doctor and all the health professionals involved in the immunisation rollout have had their APRA, Australian Health Practitioner Regula Regulation Agency, registration checked as part of employment, that all health professionals involved have completed the online training provided through the Australian College of Nursing and the company has advised that it has copies of the successful certificate of completion of the course for each health prof professional involved in the vaccine rollout. The revised advice that we've just received 
is that on further investigation, HCA has now advised that the doctor had not completed the required training. This is in being investigated by, H by HCA and we are expecting a report later today. HCA has advised that all other HCA immunisers have completed the training. HCA has also advised that this doctor has not been involved in the vaccination rollout in any other facilities, Mr. Pre um, uh, Deputy President. And we provide this information because we feel it's important to be upfront with the Australian people. Uh, and there is, a, there is, in fact, an investigation being undertaken into this matter by the DCMO, Michael Kidd. Minister, <coughs> Senator Gallagher. Are you yeah, seeking sorry, I just um, seek leave to take note of the minister's. Is leave um, granted? Leave is answer. granted. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Yes, uh, thank you. Mm. I don't know whether I should cede to my leader, but uh, look, thank you, and um, I acknowledge the update from Minister Hunt and Minister Colbeck in this in this uh, chamber following question time. I would say it is extremely concerning uh, to have inaccurate information provided publicly in media conferences earlier today uh, and to both houses of this parliament about the early stages of a vaccine rollout to extremely vulnerable Australians in residential aged care. Uh, and it's clear that the government either has taken the word of providers without doing its own checks, which is worrying, uh, the minister alluded to APRA. Um, it sounds whether there's a question about whether there was restrictions on this doctor. Um, we would welcome that information to come back to this chamber. Um, what sort of checks has the government done when they've outsourced this? I mean, this is the Commonwealth taking responsibility for an area that they don't usually operate in, running immunisation programs that the states and territories are well across how they do it. You've taken responsibility for aged care. You're putting in place a vaccination program. And on the first day, almost, we have two <laughs> residents of residential aged care in hospital because their vaccination was botched by a doctor that hasn't been trained. I don't think this sends a message of um, assurance uh, to residents of aged care or indeed the broader Australian community about the vaccine. We need confidence in this vaccine rollout. We need to people to believe that it's done, that it's done safely by trained professionals who have had all the ticks in their boxes um, and that the government has checked all this. And it seems from what we're learning now is that that's not the case. You are taking the word of private providers who no doubt have got very large fat contracts from this government taxpayer to deliver this service and it should be delivered safely and residents of aged care should have confidence that this government has their back on it. Um, you know, it's really, you know, it's, it might be trying to be portrayed as misinformation from a provider, but it goes to the heart of the safety and quality of this vaccine rollout. Um, and I think uh, any further information needs to be brought back to this chamber at the earliest opportunity. And the government needs to work out how it's going to ensure that there is confidence in this process, that the information you're being provided, the minister was out um, very reasonably early this morning with this information. So it sat out there all day that this doctor was trained and that there was nothing really to worry about. Um, these updates you know, are extremely dis you know, concerning, I think, and the government needs to put in place better checks. And I have no doubt there'll be more questions from the opposition on this. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Sorry. So the question is that uh, the Senate take note of the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to the um, motions to take note of answers. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham and Cash to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher and me. Deputy President, I rise to take note of these answers more in sorrow than in anger. Though I have to say, this has been a harrowing week for members of parliament, for parliamentary staff, for ministerial staff, for female journalists, for women across Australia. The idea that in this day and age, in this building, an alleged rape can occur 
in the Minister for Defence's office, on the Minister for Defence's couch. This is meant to be a safe building. This is meant to be a safe workplace. Every workplace should be a safe workplace. But with the Parliament of Australia, we should set a higher standard. There are points in the last 10 days where I can't believe that I or any other member are saying the words we're saying. An alleged rape of a young woman, a ministerial staffer, by another ministerial staffer on the couch of the Defence Minister's office. And what compounds this situation, this horror, for Ms Higgins, the victim here of this alleged rape, what compounds it for her and what compounds it for every other woman who has had an experience like this or has supported a friend or relative in the aftermath of an experience like this. Because let's be blunt, these kinds of experiences are all too common. And what is so traumatic for Ms Higgins, as well as for every woman who has had to relive or be triggered by this story being told over and over, is that Ms Higgins did not feel she was supported. Ms Higgins, by her own words, felt pressured to choose between seeking justice from the police or keeping her job. And when we turn to how this matter has been handled since Ms Higgins so bravely stood up and told her story to the nation because she could find no other way to get healing and justice, what has been so extraordinary is that the Minister for Defence, and while I wish her all the best in her medical current medical situation. I wish her her recovery. But her actions for the last 10 days, she has misled this chamber on multiple occasions. She has said things that are not true about Ms Higgins. Ms Higgins has been forced to come back and go on the record, to put forward her version of events. And when we look at the conduct of ministerial offices and ministerial staff, we now have evidence that three, possibly four members of the Prime Minister's staff knew about this some two years ago. We now have a Prime Minister who says his staff didn't know about it until last week. We have a Prime Minister himself who seems to be the one person in this building who had no idea about an alleged rape in his Minister for Defence office. Today we found out that the Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, knew. We know that Minister Cash knew. We know, though we don't know exactly when, Minister Reynolds knew. My heart goes out to Ms Higgins. And let me be clear, our pursuit of this matter is not just on behalf of Brittany Higgins, but it's on behalf of every woman who comes to work in this parliament or in any other workplace in Australia and deserves to have the confidence that she can be safe in doing her job and be supported if something occurs, to get healing and to get justice. And so the questions we ask and will continue to ask will be to that aim. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Henderson, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to take, make a contribution to this take note debate. And I agree with Senator Keneally that this has been a very harrowing week for us as members of parliament and senators and members, for parliamentary staff, and frankly, for all Australians to learn about the allegations of an alleged sexual assault in Parliament House. This is a very serious matter, and this is a very distressing matter. These allegations are very distressing. And my heart also goes out to 
Brittany Higgins. She has been remarkably courageous. She has been remarkably strong. And as I've done a few days ago, I again want to place on record my relief in some respects that she has decided to make a formal complaint to police. Because I think everyone in this building, everyone listening to this debate, every woman and man across this country expects that when these very serious alleged crimes occur, justice must be done. That's what we want to see, justice. And I hope and trust and expect, as we all do, that the police will fully investigate this allegation as well, we hope, as the allegations made by other women in relation to this alleged perpetrator. As the Prime Minister has made clear, the welfare of Ms Higgins and other women who have come forward is paramount. Absolutely paramount. And I want to reflect on Senator Birmingham's contribution to the Senate on Monday morning when he said and reiterated that Minister Reynolds has expressed to the Senate how deeply sorry she is that despite her genuine efforts and intentions of support, a Ms Higgins did feel unsupported at the time of her alleged sexual assault. In telling her story, Ms Higgins has prompted a national conversation about how we ensure women are safe, and I also add how we ensure men are safe in this workplace that we are all a part of. And this needs to be more than a conversation. It needs, we need to make sure that the appropriate action is taken. And I'm very pleased, of course, that the minister, Senator Birmingham, is leading an independent review, a cross-party review at arm's length to look at how we can prevent such incidents in the future, uh, to do a better job in how they are handled and how anyone in Ms Higgins' situation can be better supported. And we've got universal support for that aspiration. I, I, I do want to place on record my concern about the attack and some of the focus on Senator Reynolds. She's currently in hospital. She has spoken about her medical issues and she is I hope going to be very well very quickly. But I think there has been by the Labor Party an unwarranted focus on Senator Reynolds where there has been more focus on the gotcha moment than on justice. All of us want to see justice. We want the politics taken out of this. Now that there is a formal police investigation underway, uh, I say let's let the police do their job. To the extent that there are unanswered questions, please allow the police to do their job so that in no way can this investigation be compromised. The police will have the full scope to ask all relevant questions and to interview all relevant people in relation to these allegations. So I say again to Brittany and to other women and men who may have suffered this type of terrible alleged crime, uh, we can do better, we will do better, and we want to see justice done. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. And um, I rise to also take note of questions asked uh, to Senator Birmingham today. And I would just, uh, following on from Senator Henderson's um, comments, make a couple of, of comments on those. Um, Senator Henderson accuses of us of uh, focusing unreasonably on uh, Minister Reynolds, Senator Reynolds. Um, and I would uh, just say to Senator Henderson, who's left the room, that um, our job as an opposition is to hold the government to account. Um, there have been a serious allegation of a crime occurring in 
the Defence Minister's office. Um, there are a number of questions about her conduct as a minister, what she did, what she knew, how she followed up, who she told, what actions she took, uh, for which she is accountable to this chamber. Um, now, this is not anything personal about Senator Reynolds, and of course we all wish her well, uh, and we're all um, sorry to hear that of, of her medical condition um, earlier today. But that does not mean that we do not ask questions, uh, reasonable questions about the minister's conduct uh, and expect to have those questions answered. And what we've seen this week and last week, uh, through um, five question times, I think, that Minister Reynolds has faced questions, is every question as it relates to her conduct, what she did, what she knew, how she followed up, how she provided duty of care uh, to this staff member in her office um, were not answered. Uh, we are not going into the ins and outs of what is alleged to have occurred and by whom, um, and anything that the police may be uh, seeking um, to investigate as part of their inquiries. We have not gone near any of that. We understand that that is an area for police investigation and we as senators are not here to perform that role, but we are here to hold the minister to account. She is the Defence Minister of Australia. She is a senior cabinet minister in this government. And these are legitimate questions about her conduct, her suitability, her capability. And that they are entirely reasonable questions to ask. Now, we have been blocked, and I don't know whether the uh, Minister Reynolds is operating under instructions from another office not to answer questions and to block and stall with the hope that this will go away and eventually the caravan will move on to another issue um, because that appears to be some of the strategy. The other strategy could be to provide conflicting information that makes it all very confusing about what's happened so nobody really answers and we keep going around in a bit of a circle. Um, you know, we have an expectation that this minister should have probably come into this chamber as early as last Tuesday morning and made a full statement about what she knew and what she did to this chamber. And that could have avoided uh, some of the questions or some of the blocking of, um, of answers that has been going on in question time. But no statement has been provided to this chamber, no statement from the Prime Minister. Can you think of another crime or allegations of a crime occurring in a senior minister's office being dealt with this way if it wasn't about an alleged rape between two Liberal staffers. I can't think of it, one, where that would be the case and where it was a no-go, no nobody can ask questions, um, you know, everything should be pushed away until the police investigate and we move on to another story. Well, we're not going to because we think there are legitimate questions about this minister's conduct about what she knew and what she did, and whether these allegations of this crime occurring were pushed aside in the context of a political campaign to be um, dealt with at a later time or quite happily, possibly not dealt with at all. This has been going on for two years, and we do not have clear answers from this minister about her conduct and her role in what appears on the surface to be a cover-up of a very serious um, allegations of a crime occurring in this building under this government. They are legitimate questions to ask. We don't seek to attack Minister Reynolds personally, and we haven't, but we will hold this government to account. We will hold this minister to account. There are questions that remain unanswered, and if Ms. Minister Reynolds is unable to answer them, then Ms. Minister Birmingham should, and I think, as, as the big boss in town, that the Prime Minister should also front up and provide answers to these chambers. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Chair at uh, President. Today, I'm reflecting on how proud I felt joining the Senate 18 months ago, joining this august body this body whose role it is, uh, quite rightly, to provide balance uh, in government, to be a house of review, and for the opposition's role in that process of holding the government to account. And yet today, 
in front of my colleagues, in front of the, the children here, I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed in my heart and my stomach at the politicisation politi of such matters with real humans at the heart of it. The lack of respect at the heart of it. Because there is appropriately a place for the opposition to ask questions. But this ongoing caravan, this circus performance, this confected outrage would go on and on. So many in this place, others who have had experience of such sexual attacks of rape, who are both here and in the other place and right around Australia, have this matter compounded. I'm sorry, would you like to speak up or would you like to speak while I'm speaking? Um, Senator Davey, I remind you, Senator MacDonald, sorry, I remind you to direct your remarks to the chair and I will manage uh, the Senate if it becomes disorderly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, because I did pay the respect of listening quietly whilst other people speak and I would ask for that same respect. Because yes, respect. You're entitled to that. Order. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Thank you. Because respect is at the heart of this matter. So many in this place and the other, so many around Australia who have experienced matters such as this, who are reliving it, who are re-triggered by the continued and compounded actions of the opposition. People in this community who listen to what happens in this chamber have moved from watching the appropriate questions of the opposition, have moved from a creeping sense of horror at the politicisation and the continued abuse of not just this woman but of others and the absence of respect. It is not the role of the opposition to act like investigator and judge and jury. And it surprises me because the opposition has made quite a deal of calling for an increased number of women to come to politics and into this place. And yet it is our role to provide something different, something additional in coming into this place and a sense of compassion, a sense of the human element is so incredibly important and that has tragically been lost, as I said, in this ongoing uh, compounding of the abuse of not just this woman but any other person who has suffered uh, a sexual assault. And I do, I feel deeply ashamed to sit here and be a part of this performance. We all agree that every workplace should be a place of safety, that every person should have the confidence to come forward to report any such allegations and incidents. And yet I think we have done irreparable damage because every person who has suffered at the cans of such an attack must now be wondering, is this going to happen to me? Am I going to be paraded through the streets for some political benefit? Because this is now a matter for the appropriate people to investigate, for the police to investigate. There is a deep determination, I'm sure, from all who work in this place to ensure that we do change, we do improve, we do build a culture where there is uh, an independence of, uh, of a reporting process and the Prime Minister... Thank and you, Senator MacDonald. Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, uh, thank you. Madam Deputy President. 
What we want to see here in the Senate and what all Australians need to feel is confidence, Madam Deputy President, confidence that we have leadership that is all of those things that provide stability, security, safety, hope for the future and, in particular, transparency and accountability when things go wrong. And things do go wrong. They do go wrong, Madam Deputy President, whether it's in a personal scenario or a professional scenario, things do go wrong. But here in the Senate, when things go wrong, as uncomfortable as it may be, we all have a responsibility to ask the questions. We have a responsibility to focus on process. We have a responsibility to keep asking the questions that forever remain hidden from being answered. That is our job as senators here. That is our job as opposition senators. That is our job as crossbench senators to keep transparency and accountability to those in power. The people in power are our coalition colleagues, both here in the Senate and in the House. And like it or dislike it, the reality is that that power has to remain checked. Something terribly horrible went wrong right here in this parliament. After hours, when a young girl had no support, when only now has she taken the courage to speak up. So we keep asking the questions about the process. We keep asking the questions that need to be asked in order to hopefully come out on the other side with a better place of safety for all people who work, not only in this building, but for all Australians to see that there are intolerable acts against others that should never be accepted, never be accepted. So sometimes it is hard to ask those questions, but they are never coming from a personal point of wanting to damage someone. They are coming from a sense of responsibility of our roles as senators to keep those in power accountable. Just as we ourselves are accountable to our constituents in the roles that we conduct ourselves in back in our own jurisdictions and here in this place. There is no doubting the sensitivities involved on every level here. But the obfuscation from the Prime Minister down in answering important questions both in the House and from ministers in here are legitimate concerns that we will continue to keep raising. We are unafraid and unashamed to keep asking these questions. You may wish to pose a picture that portrays us as heartless but that is not the case because you know as much as we do that the discomfort you feel has to be made bare because all Australians expect answers and we've not seen answers in these past fortnight. We've not seen answers and Labor will continue to pursue in the interest of justice and fairness and to eventually reach a position of suitability, safety for all Australians, whether they work in Parliament House, whether they work in businesses across the country, whether they live in their homes. If it is up to senators here on this side to ask the hard questions, let me reassure you we will continue to do so.
Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the response from Senator Cash to the question I asked in question time. The Nutter-Salingham family, otherwise known as the Biloela family, has made a life here in Australia. This country is their home, and they are much loved members of the Biloela community. It is absolutely outrageous the way the government has treated this family and the way the government has wasted so much time and taxpayers' money persecuting this family and being cruel to an innocent family. It was around three years ago that this family was ripped from their home and their community in Biloela without warning, under the cover of darkness, in a pre-dawn raid. And to describe uh, that episode as extremely traumatic, especially for the two young children, would be a gross understatement. I've seen the video of that terrible event and what that family was put through that night, particularly the two young children, was disgusting and abhorrent. Now, they've all been in immigration detention now for nearly three years and on Christmas Island for about two and a half years. Over this time, the government has deprived them arbitrarily of their liberty, has spent over $6 million of public funds on their detention and on legal fees fighting to deport them to Sri Lanka, where they have justified fear for their lives. And the government's fought this through the Federal Circuit Court, <laughs> the Federal High Court and the High Court. And I want to make the point that the minister could with just a simple stroke of his pen, immediately release this family from detention and allow them to get on with their lives in the Biloela community, where they contributed to that community and where they have been embraced so warmly. And I want to shout out to the Biloela community here, who from day one has stood up for this family and fought for this family to be returned to where they belong in Biloela. But it's not just the Biloela community that's fought for their release. Australians more broadly have been rightly horrified at their treatment by the government, with nearly a quarter of a million people signing a petition calling for their release. And when I asked Minister Cash why, the, why she is ignoring the hundreds of thousands of Australians who have called for the innocent family's release, she responded she didn't accept the premise of the question. Well, Minister, check out the petition. Check out the petition. Nearly a quarter of a million Australians have signed it. Trying to deport a family, including their two Australian-born children, in the dead of night is sadly typical of this government's heartlessness and indicative of Australia's cruel and inhumane immigration and immigration detention regimes. And I've been to Manus Island five times and I see Senator Dunningham shaking his head. I know the cruelty. I've seen it firsthand. And if anyone wants to deny the cruelty, I challenge them now. Get over to Papua New Guinea, get over to Nauru and look at these Order, poor Senator people. Dunningham. Look them in the eyes, Senator Dunningham, and you go and do that and look them in the eyes and then you can come back in here and try and convince us that you understand the, the damage that you have caused to them, the deaths that you people are personally responsible for, <coughs> the hundreds of lives that you people have destroyed through your cruel and unnecessary policy of indefinite immigration detention, including your cruel policy of indefinite offshore detention. You have ruined lives. You have broken Australia's international obligation. You are responsible for people's deaths. You have collectively, and I say this to the LNP and the ALP, got blood on your hands. 
People should not be in immigration detention in this country for any more than seven days without a court order. <clears throat> now, I thank Senator Cash for seeking further advice on the riot that occurred on Christmas Island in January, and I look forward to her coming back into this chamber and sharing further advice with her order. colleagues. Senator McKim, the question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.